Hey guys, welcome back to Amygdala Vids, the channel that you can rely on for subpar pop philosophy. Today we're going to be looking at Ralph Waldo Emerson's Divinity School Address, which offers a controversial look at Jesus Christ, and the importance of us human individuals within a religious context. But before we start guys, I want to give a quick shout out to no one. No one. So way back in 1838, just yesterday really, Ralph Waldo Emerson gave the speech to a graduating class at the Harvard Divinity School. Now although there were only just a couple students, ministers, and professors there, this Chad decided to give a speech that disagreed with the perspectives of the audience. I mean that takes guts. It'd be like giving a speech about human decency to the executives at Twitter. Now Harvard at the time was pretty big on the whole Unitarian thing, but a lot of the critiques Emerson raises in his essay can be seen mainly to be opposing, for lack of a better word, traditional Christian thought. But we'd really have to look into the essay to see specifically what he's opposing. So we start out the essay with classic poetic Emerson talking about how beautiful nature is. One is constrained to respect the perfection of this world, in which our senses converse, how wide, how rich, what invitation from every property it gives to every faculty of man. But hold up, hold up, this ain't just another nature worship philosophy. Emerson then says, hey, you know what's better than this whole natural world though? Universal laws. But the moment the mind opens and reveals the laws which traverse the universe and make things the way they are, then shrinks the great world at once into a mere illustration and fable of this mind. What am I? And what is? Asks the human spirit with a curiosity new kindled, but never to be quenched. So we got this physical world, and while it's beautiful, it's not really universal. Things change, people age, trees get old, all that jazz. But these universal or divine laws that Emerson is talking about is something that is unchanging and forever. Emerson brings up this phrase, sentiment of virtue, in relation to these divine laws. The sentiment of virtue is a reverence and delight in the presence of certain divine laws. It perceives that this homely game of life we play covers, under what seem foolish details, principles that astonish. So the next obvious question then is what these laws are. I mean, if they're divine, they seem pretty important, right? We should know what they are. Well, unfortunately, these laws can't really be given to us by others, some third party. These laws refuse to be adequately stated. They will not by us or for us be written on paper or spoken by the tongue. They elude, evade our preserving thought, and yet we read them hourly in each other's faces, in each other's actions, in our own remorse. Okay, great. It's difficult to get this from other people. Alright, Emerson, stop beating around the bush and tell us how we could get these divine laws. The intuition of the moral sentiment is an insight of the perfection of the laws of the soul. These laws execute themselves. They are out of time, out of space, and not subject to circumstance. Thus, in the soul of man, there is a justice whose retributions are instant and entire. If a man is at heart just, then insofar is he God. The safety of God, the immortality of God, the majesty of God do enter into that man with justice. So this is weird. Emerson says we could gain insight into these divine laws by our soul and our intuition. So this is pretty radical because he's putting the emphasis not from the outside, like the gospel or from preachers, but instead he wants to place the importance on ourselves and our intuition. So it seems like we could enter the divine if we act justly, which we could do through our intuition. This is also pretty radical because it goes against that narrative of the stupid humans doing dumb shit, then God comes in separately to correct it and the cycle repeats. It's a pretty sad, nihilistic view of what it means to be a human being. But by allowing the divine to be a part of a human being, then perhaps it'd be more uplifting. And this point about placing the emphasis on our intuition is pretty important for Emerson and for us, who often find ourselves being swept away by some moral commandments coming from the outside. This doesn't mean we can't find any value in the teachings of others, but we could find those teachings to be true in ourselves as well. It is an intuition. It cannot be received at second hand. Truly speaking, it is not instruction, but provocation that I could receive from another soul. What he announces I must find true in me, or wholly reject, and on his word or as his second, be he who he may, I can accept nothing. Now we get to probably the most interesting part of the essay, taking everything we just went over, 
Emerson is going to explain his unique interpretation of Jesus Christ. So just to recap, Emerson is placing an emphasis on ourselves as human individuals when it comes to exploring these divine laws. There then is some divinity in us from what I understand. Now when we think of humanity colliding with divinity, one name comes to mind, that of Jesus Christ. Now I didn't really know how to title this traditional view of Jesus, but the position Emerson is attacking is this view of Christ that emphasizes solely the divine while suppressing his humanity. He said in his jubilee of sublime emotion, I am divine. Through me, God acts. Through me, speaks. Would you see God, see me, or see thee, when thou also thinkest as I now think? But what a distortion did his doctrine and memory suffer in the same, in the next, and the following ages. There is no doctrine of reason which will bear to be taught by the understanding. The understanding caught this high chant from the poet's lips, and said in the next age, This was Jehovah come down out of heaven. I will kill you if you say he was a man. So Emerson talks about how the churches are built on the tropes of Christ but not his principles. I think about the brilliant Scorsese film The Last Temptation of Christ, which paints a more human version of Jesus. He doubts, he cries, he gets angry, he has faults that he works through. He's not this stoic figure that the Bible can sometimes make him out to be. And that film was quickly condemned by many people belonging to the church because it highlighted the humanity of Jesus. And I think it's interesting to think about the practical consequences of these two conceptions of Christ. It seems that this divine image of Jesus might make us think, well, we can never be as good as Christ, so what's the use in trying? What's the use in striving for a goal you can't obtain? But if you switch our thoughts on Jesus for a more human approach, then it seems more attainable and perhaps more motivating. I could be wrong though, these are just my own thoughts on the matter. Getting back to Emerson, he wants to point out two problems with the traditional church conception of Christ that suppresses his humanity. The first is what I was kind of hinting at about separating Jesus from the rest of us humans. Remember, Emerson says that our intuition can help us towards the sentiment of virtue, because the divine can be within us. This is what Jesus did. He used his intuition to allow the divine to flow through him, which led him to act in certain ways. By putting Christ above everyone else, it tells us humans that they can't do that which is contrary to what Emerson is trying to say. The second problem is that these divine laws are said to have come from an outside God long ago, and therefore, there'd be no need for all this intuition talk and self-discovery within the divine. God told us these moral truths and then peaced out. No more action is required on our part besides just obeying. Emerson even mentions that this perspective can lead to the whole God is dead thing, another interesting connection between Emerson and Nietzsche. I definitely recommend Living Philosophy's video on the subject, by the way. But what does this mean for churches? Some preacher gets up on stage and just repeats these laws in a dry, objective manner? Or just reads directly from the gospel without any connection to our lives? In a tone reminiscent of HAL 9000 rather than an actual human? Churches then just become very anti-personal. Now I've been to a lot of churches, some good, some bad, and my best experiences were when I went to Sunday school and we were able to actually get ourselves involved personally. We'd have group discussions over certain moral ideas coming from the Bible, and it was pretty interactive. I mean, Sunday school is pretty dope overall, because you also might be watching Prince of Egypt, which is extremely underrated. But what a snooze fest it is to just be lectured at. You know, we often look down on kids that get bored during church, even though we secretly don't want to admit the same. But perhaps there's some hidden wisdom in those emotions. Whenever the pulpit is usurped by a formalist, then is the worshiper defrauded and disconsolate. We shrink as soon as the prayer begins, which do not uplift, but smite and offend us. We are fain to wrap our cloaks about us, and secure, as best we can, a solitude that hears not. I once heard a preacher who solely tempted me to say, I would go to church no more. Do you think this anti-personal nature of some churches contributed to the rise of secularism? Share your thoughts in the comments below, but Emerson might think so. From the views I have already expressed, you will infer the sad conviction which I share, I believe, with numbers, of the universal decay and now almost death of faith in society. The soul is not preached. The church seems to totter to its fall, almost all life extinct. Now Emerson does go on a bit more, but hopefully I was able to convey just with this small snippet of this speech that there are some pretty interesting ideas at play here. The importance of humanity and religion, intuition and morality, the anti-personal church services, and the decline of faith. 
As always, I highly, highly recommend you read the text yourself, but especially this time, because it's Emerson and the language is beautiful. But I also implore you to share your thoughts below because these ideas are not only interesting, but still relevant today with Christianity and other religious beliefs not being as popular as they once were. If you got any value out of this video, even if that value is watching me embarrass myself trying to recite Emerson in a dramatic fashion, then do me a favor and hit the subscribe button below, and turn on notifications for the next video. As always, I wish you all a beautiful rest of your day.